to welcome all of you in this uh, interesting two sessions meeting uh, through webinars. Today we are having uh, two sessions. One is retina and the other one is pediatric with an eminent speakers. So I, I wish that you will enjoy with us today the discussion and interactive session. If anyone want to ask any question, he can send his question through the uh, icon there. It's a uh, question and answer. And if you want to interact with us, he can just raise his hand. So we'll open the mic for him and he can directly or uh, interact with us, with us uh, by asking the questions. Um, uh, today, I, uh, it is the, this meeting is sponsored by uh, Bayer, and I would like to thank them for sponsoring our meeting. And I will introduce uh, Razan from Bayer. She's a marketing manager. She will just uh, want to talk with you in one or two minutes. Razan. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, doctors. Uh, my name is Razan. I'm from Bayer, from the marketing department. We're having as well my colleague Lima from the medical department. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the Middle East ophthalmology meeting and special thanks to Dr. Mohamed Amri for uh, giving us actually this opportunity to meet all of you and uh, we really appreciate the new te technology nowadays which uh, didn't allow the COVID to keep us away from each other. I will not take uh, much time I believe uh, we want to start on time so I'm uh, wishing you a very fruitful interactive and valuable meeting ahead. Thanks uh, all and looking forward. Uh, thank you Razan and thanks for being again for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, it's very special thanks to Razan and uh, Lima and Muhammad Jabbar from Bayer, who they are behind this uh, meeting. Uh, and I'd like to thank my uh, guest speakers. I'm proud today to have a very eminent speaker worldwide. Uh, we are having a, a written session, Dr. Mandeep Lamba and Dr. Noura Al Mansouri, Dr. Tarek Sadiqi. Uh, this is uh, a speaker in the first session with uh, also uh, a, a talk for uh, Bayer by, presented by. Uh, Lima. Uh, and we are having also a sessions uh, for pediatric uh, ophthalmology and we are I'm really uh, yeah, I'm very glad that Dr. Nihal accept our invitations. She is uh, uh, all the time busy, but she is giving us this opportunity to meet her and to learn from her. And she is a well-known pediatric ophthalmology worldwide and especially in management of cataract in pediatric. Also my dear friends, Dr. Hayat Khan, is a well-known figure in Dubai, Health Authority Dubai Hospital, and he's a pediatric ophthalmology. And this is, I think, the second time with us in our webinars. And we are having also Dr. My dear friend, Dr. Ihab al -Babli. He will moderate with me the pediatric sessions. Uh, in addition, we are having Dr. Asim. Uh, Dr. Asim is a well-known also figure pediatric ophthalmology. He is working in, I think, Canada. I think Toronto, Dr. Hayat, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and he will join us maybe a little bit. Yes, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Asim Ali is the Chief of Services at Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hayat. So without any further ado, we will start our first sessions. And the first speaker with us today, Dr. Mandeep, is a veterinary surgeon in uh, Dubai uh, Hospital, and he will give us a case presentation. Now we are 10, uh, sorry, 8 and 9. You are having nine minutes for presentation, Dr. Mandeep, please. Just uh, mute, uh, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, can you hear me, Dr. Amri? Yes, 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 please, go ahead. All right, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to Thank Bayer for this wonderful opportunity to share some of my and my colleagues' experiences. And of course, Dr. Amri for keep stimulating our brain, you know, throughout this tough COVID era. So thank you, Dr. Amri. The scenario which I'm going to discuss today is something we in Dubai Hospital, the so physicians in Dubai Hospital faced in, in the year 2017, uh, later half of the year. Uh, it was quite some time that we did not have ILEA available in our pharmacy in our uh, armatorium and we were still stuck with the other contemporary drugs because of some uh, administrative reasons. While all our colleagues uh, outside DHA were using it, sharing their experiences with ILEA, we never had one. So in the later half of 2017, the moment ILEA made way in our practice, 
there were a lot of patients whom we had actually labeled to be you know tough cases difficult to treat uh, non responders or late responders we switched them to ilia and that's what made a scenario of compulsory switch so i have a series of four or five cases uh, time is less so i'll just run through the octs and i'll use the oct 2d uh, topography to actually show you the progression and resolution of these macular edemas and what we did with these patients so this is a case series of five patients i hope i can make keep up the time this was the first patient who had a uh, right eye somehow stood always normal that's how she presented to us left eye had few focal dots of few focal edemas around the macula over a period of next 18 months she received nine injections to treat dme but she kept worsening over a period of 18 months so we see there is a cumulative effect of a diffuse macular edema at the end of 18 months and yeah whenever we used to inject lucentis to her she used to respond to it but she used to come back with uh, i mean worsening edemas so had i had aflibercep at that point of time from protocol t we know that it gives you a head start as compared to the other drugs and that carries on till one year uh, as compared to the other uh, medications like uh, avastin and lucentis um uh, that the effect actually got maintained to two years although it was not statistically significant in comparison with ranibizumab so this patient just required two injections of ilia on a monthly basis you can see the edema actually uh, resolved quite well uh, i attributed this patient with uh, focal treat laser treatment to target those uh, cluster of microlesions which are creating these exudates and the next treatment next injection this lady required was 14 months later so she was doing well broadly speaking we know that any patients uh, presenting dean over patients presenting with visual acuity less than 20 40 actually all drugs do well it comes to the patients with poor visual acuity it's actually uh, the ilia which uh, gives you a, a better performance at the end of one year uh, you retina guidelines for bevacizumab is it's, it's, it's a good drug to be used with patients who have got good visual acuity it should be available for all the physicians although that is not the case practically speaking uh talking of your retina recommendations for aflubercep it has emerged as a drug of choice for uh, a treatment of dme especially in the patients who have baseline visual acuity below 69 letters uh it clearly emerged winner in comparison with laser treatment and laser treatment these days is not the gold standard it used to be before in tvgfera the second patient actually presented to us with a bilateral cystic kind of dme it was treated by one of my colleagues this patient had a recent cardiovascular event and that is the reason the my colleague decided to go ahead with ozodex injection so this patient received bilateral free ozodex in from day 1 to 11 month 11 so the ocds which we are seeing is actually month 11 in both eyes so she was responding well to the ozodex but eventually you know the edema used to come back again and again so we know that ozodex is or steroids in general has been recommended as second line of treatment for patients who are not responder but primary line of treatment for patients who have had major cardiovascular events you need to be careful with patients who have had high iops and have uh, a fake x so this patient also received just one injection of ilia she flattened out second eye also with just injection of ilia flattened out uh, before this we had to have a discussion with his with the patient's cardiologist that we going to give anti vegf and she was under the watch of her her physician as well so the next treatment she required was an injection of uh, ilia again which is after 6 months so this was again a, a a case example which we believe that we have got a magical weapon in our hand uh, we all know that these uh, presumptions can really be unruly sometimes so we go to case 3 which was being treated by uh, by me actually I did a focal laser for this patient along with lucentis. Six lucentis were given, and we were really struggling to to control this DME. This was uh, basically a non-responder. So once we started him on ilia, the patient actually didn't respond very well to ilia as well. So I had to go ahead with a combination of laser, and I, uh, in a patchy manner, I did a grid laser, a conventional grid laser, in two different settings. There were a lot of microlesions which were exposed and leaking onto this edema. and along with this we gave her three shots of ilia as well in next 6 months by sure the picture the macula flattened out 
and you can see all the exudates have actually vanished. So yeah, we can say that laser treatment is not a gold standard, but it is still recommended as a line of management as an adjuvant to the anti-emergent treatment or for matter for that matter, any other uh, modality of treatment. When you compare head-to-head -head, uh, comparison of all the three uh, anti-vegifs, eflibercept actually required less number of laser treatments as compared to the other two counterparts. Well, case four was, this was the right eye. You can see there is hardly uh, any, I mean, tissues left in the, the internal nuclear layers are completely macerated. The RP is also completely toned out. So uh, we were a little overconfident with this drug and we did inject this patient with two ileas. Nothing happened, nothing was expected to happen. I mean, no surprises there. It was a very bad case to begin with. But the left eye of this patient was very interesting. That's how she was when we started treating her. That's how she was after three doses of leucentis. And by the time Ilya came, I said, it's fine. We're just going to put her on Ilya and she's going to be fine. So uh, I recommended her three injections on a monthly basis, Ilya. And she comes back with this. So that was a surprise. So whenever you get such a surprising result, you dig into the history and the physical parameters of the patient. This patient, uh, just before our last injection, was actually admitted in ICCU with she had a history of CCF, congestive cardiac failure, and she had an acute on chronic episodes. So we know that any kind of congestive systemic diseases like nephrotic syndrome, chronic nephrotic syndrome, or CCFs can worsen DME. So this was a typical case in that category. And you can see uh, your retina recommendations also suggest to take care of systemic hypertension, which can, of course, worsen DMEs. My last case in the row is a, is a very interesting case, which was being treated by, by my colleague, Dr. Fazal, in the Bay Hospital. He had been treating this patient for around 18 months to two, year, two years. And he was finding a very, very unique phenomena. You know, he said the patient responds to anti vegf treatment. He was being on leucentis actually. But every time he comes back with a flitting kind of uh, macular edema, you know, the, Sometimes it comes out in a different area and then the geometry of the whole edema location keeps changing. It responds and it comes out in a blister format. He also noticed a glistening on the, on the macula. And that's when he referred this patient to me. Uh, when the patient came to me, he had this diffuse macular edema. And I thought, okay, let's go ahead with ILEA and solve the problem. Well, after two injections of ILEA, the, the flitting nature of the, the macular edema actually continued. You can see... The temporal part is fine, but uh, we have another bullet on the on at the MB around the MP bundle. So this patient has typical characteristics of glistening appearance of the of the macula. He had macular folds, dot ILM folds, and he has those cyst under the ILM, which give you an indication that maybe we are dealing with a case of dot ILM. Although there was no no traction in this case, I decided to go ahead with vitrectomy with ILM peeling, which is controversial in these. Uh, these indications where you don't have non, I mean, you have non-trational DMEs or you don't have any traction rather. Three weeks post PPV, this patient had worsened DME. After that, I put him on ILEA. We gave him two injections on a monthly basis and the patient settled down. Uh, the OCT which you are seeing is actually 25 months post last ILEA. She's still maintaining that vision. She's still maintaining that uh, morphology. Although a bit atrophic, the central folial thickness is 192, but, uh, but it worked out for us. So your retina recommendations for past plana are it's a, it's a, it's a, it has emerged as an indication for vitreoretinal tractions, although its role remains controversial in non-tractional cases. There is level two evidences supporting a uh, role of vitreoretinal in non-tractional cases, but yeah, we don't have any head-to-head -head, uh, RCT supporting them. To summarize, aflibercept is a drug of choice in DME with baseline visual activity below 69 letters. And it has shown superiority to bevacizumab at two years, uh, shown superiority to ranibizumab at one year of treatment. Aflibercept is clearly superior to standalone laser therapy. Steroid emerge, steroid emerge as second line of treatment. And of course, vitrectomy is, is a standard for traction type of uh, DMEs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Mandeep. An excellent presentation and very good cases. Uh, there is a lot of questions here we need to ask you actually and to discuss with you within this coming five minutes. 
Uh, first of all, I want to ask uh, any of my dear colleagues, Dr. Tarek or Dr. Anura, and they are uh, uh, retinal surgeons, to if there is any question to Dr. Mandeep. Any also from the diatic, they are all ophthalmologists. Anyone have any question to Dr. Mandeep according to his case's presentation? Yes. Dr. Tarek, Dr. Anura, you have any question to Dr. Mandeep? Otherwise, he will ask you later on. Huh? Be careful. He is preparing a lot of questions for you. So you have to, to ask him. Okay. I have Dr. a Anura. question. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, such a great presentation. And uh, I'm sure you have a, a great number of patients to start switching from one anti VGF to the other one and to see a marvelous uh, outcome. And uh, my question is uh, for. Uh, because I am going to present a case similar to your last case, which is a retinal membrane and uh, uh, vitreo retinal interface uh, abnormalities. So, uh, in this patient, did you do any fluorescein? Did you think about uh, because the, the edema was very aggressive edema to start with, right? And I'm not sure what was the presenting uh, vision. So. Uh... Uh, I, I really don't remember the vision to be very frank, Dr. Noura, because uh, yeah. uh, the, the presentation was not based on it. So I don't want to comment on that. But uh, the first thing, your question was about angiography. Yeah, this is, this is an indication where I always do an angiography before I take up a patient for, for any retinal surgery, specifically when it is a non-tractional DNAs. I do operate them, although it is a very unconventional uh, indication. But we need to do a DME just to rule out whether, I mean, are we dealing with DME or we're dealing with actually ischemia, which is presenting as DME. So I do a, I'm not relying on Okta here. I'm actually doing a, a full-blown FFA for these patients. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mandeep. Uh, any other question, Dr. Tarek? Do you have any question for him? Dr. Ihab, Dr. Nihal, anyone? Dr. Tarek, you have any question to Dr. Mandeep? Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay, I have, uh, uh, actually, I want just to, to summarize your presentation, if you allow me, Dr. Mandeep. Sure, sure. So now we are talking about management of diabetic macular edema, and we are known the gold standard now is anti-BGF, then if not, we are going to steroid. Uh, but uh, do you think now still you are shifting from one, uh, I mean, anti-BGF to another one? No, we don't. Generally, the switch these days is uh, like intercategory switch. We don't. I generally don't uh, switch from one anti-VEGF to other. This was a different case scenario, you know, when we didn't have the choices. So why? Started... Why you didn't shift now from one to another one? Why? What is the justifications? There is no response. I mean, if you are starting with, uh, uh, if you start with the sentence, for example, then you are having a power or stronger uh, uh, anti-VEGF. You don't give a chance for that uh, anti-VEGF. Maybe it will work. And as according to your presentation and the cases that you present, it shows that they are a very uh, any different, uh, any, a very good improvement when you shift from one uh, antibiotic to another one. Uh, because Dr. Amri, I, I start with ILEA these days, to be very frank with you. I follow okay, your so, retina guidelines. Yeah. That's so another the, question. That means if you start with a strong, you, know, you don't go back to another one. But if you have an imicentist patient, are you going to shift to anti-VGF? Yes, I would. Yes, I would shift to ILEA and then move to the other categories. Why, why you are shifting to ILEA, for example? What is the ra uh, rationale behind shifting from the sentence to ILEA? Well, your, your uh, vivid VISTA studies clearly show, you know, that if once you've moved from uh, Lucentis to ILEA, there is still scope for improvement in these patients. You know, I would definitely like to maintain the patient of anti vegf therapy as long as possible. And there is always a tentativeness to move to steroids. And only next treatment available for you is steroids or laser. All right. So, Don't you think because of the structure of the uh, ILEA itself, it's give another one because it's not working only on anti vegf A also. It's of course. have a percent of growth and it have a, a large more affinity Maybe this is another uh, explanation. That's why you can use or shift on, for example, the sentence to antibiotic. Is this uh, acceptable for you? It's okay. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is the reason it's it's first uh, choice of drug for me. That's the precise reason. Uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Tarek, also Dr. Tarek, a well-known uh, uh, medical retina consultant, and he is using uh, a lot of antibiotic. Um, 
according to the international guidelines recommendation, what is the, the, the fair choice for you to give as an anti-BGF treatment for DME? <clears throat> I think you choose whatever is available in your, in your hospital. Uh, no, I'm not for talking me. about what's available. I'm talking on scientifically, if, if it is available, all of you. Yeah, well, 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 both of agents available, since and Ilya, they are both suitable for to start with, to be honest. Um, having said that, I mean, uh, Ilya has shown that it's, it's uh, more effective if your um, vision is less than uh, 69 liters. Uh, but still, there is a lot of of of, of uh, impact from the uh, rich, uh, from the from the cataract patients here from the cataract, which is I think the main reason for low vision in our patients. So for me, I really don't have much preference between them. So whatever is available, I'll start with them. You know. No, I'm asking, doctor, according to the I mean, the guidelines that we are hearing about it, and we are discussing all the times. So do you think there is a difference or not? That's my no, question. No, I don't think so. I think the only thing is ILEA is a is, is little bit longer uh, and uh, acting, you know, stays in the eye longer than the... the why, they, why, why the European recommendation, they say it is, uh, we have to start uh, in case, especially in case of Vision 2040 with ILEA. Yeah, well, this, during the study, they have done certification of the patient and they found the response on the long term, I think over one or two years, that this patient, they have a better response than the lucent or pifacizumab, you know. So it's just a patient certification during the study itself. No, it is, uh, I don't think but, it is a, it's a patient. It's a, a guidelines now. We are talking about guidelines and the recommendation and it will document it. Yeah, but then, you know, uh, if, if you look at You it, have an idea about this one, right? Sorry, say it again, Dr. Omri. Uh, we are talking about the recommendation and the guidelines that mentioned Absolutely. by Orbian. Yeah, it yeah. is well known, documented. It's not a, a reference of the patients, right? Exactly. Especially for the patients with letters uh, of vision starting less than six, uh, 69 yes. letters. Definitely, uh, that's the recommendation. And we are going by the, I go by the recommendation. Uh, I have not had any experience of uh, reverse switching where I have switched any patients from ILEA to Lucenta so far. I mean, just... I felt there was never a need. And yeah, these were the scenarios. Switching. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, switching yeah. mainly in wet AMD, you know, to be on more than diabetic macular edema. But differently, if you look at this study, which shows that uh, ILEA is better uh, in a vision who have a, uh, of, of letters of less than 69, over two years, three years, that it's very minimally uh, 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 better than the lucentis. Patient okay, you are going to wait. Letters. How do you explain for your patient that please wait for two years till you find the, the, the response? Uh, anyway, uh, it is it will be a controversy between doctors, but it is according to the guidelines. I don't know. Dr. Adira, you have any comment about this point? Yeah, I think because they notice that uh, the more severe the cases, they tend to do worse with Lucentis. That, that's why I will start immediately with the ILEA. Which is which, ha, which has more uh, other benefit other than only anti VGF activity. This will explain why even if you have like 20, 30 vision and you start them in lucentis and you don't see any response, you will immediately shift them to other anti VGF, not to steroid implant. I think which is I think a fair uh, practice for patients, right? Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Mandeep. Thank you, Dr. Tara, Dr. Anwar, for uh, contributions. Uh, now we'll have uh, uh, our second uh, presenter, Dr. Tarek uh, Sadiqi, is a consultant ophthalmologist medical retina in Rashid uh, Center in Ajman, um, for the Rashid Diabetic Center, actually. Uh, Dr. Tarek, the mic is you. Is start sharing your screen. <clears throat> Can you see that? Presentation no, on the screen. No, you didn't share until now. Sorry, excuse yes, me. now okay. Yes. yes. Now I'm back. Yeah, maybe give it some time. Yeah. Okay. About now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, everybody. Yes. Thank you for allocating the time to be with us in this virtual meeting. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Amri, for inviting me. So I have this presentation today. It's a gentleman who is 50 years old, gentleman, presented to the emergency department 
with the right eye vision blurring three weeks after a uh, road traffic accident. At that time, his vision was 6-12 in the right and 6-6 in the left. And Bust's history was unremarkable. Uh, he was not diabetic, but he was a hypertensive. History-wise, he was immunocompetent. And his little examination didn't show any signs of uh, uh, uveitis. So on his, on, his, on his first time presentation, this is the picture in the right and the left eye. And generally, the left eye looks normal for me and for everybody else. Right eye, well, the lesion you can describe, it's a temporal lesion here. It's, it's subretinal infiltrate, uh, whitish yellow lesion uh, approaching the fovea with the sharp edges, well demarcated edges. And you can see the corresponding OCT below it in the right side, in the right eye, I mean you can see the band of hyperreflective uh, subretinal infiltrate. Um, the gentleman was uh, sent to the medical retina clinic, but he disappeared. And uh, we were able four months later to uh, catch up with him in the medical retina, where we found that his vision in the right eye crashed down to 615 and then the left eye to 619. And the clinic picture has changed a bit. The right eye uh, temporal macular lesion has migrated or shifted to the nasal side of the macula with the involvement of the peribulbar lesion. And you can see here corresponding uh, in the OCT corresponding subretinal infiltrate of hyperreflective band. The left eye, there is a generalized grayish whitish lesion with uh, subretinal nodules. So just to have a more perception of the difference between the first time presentation and four months later, as you can see, if you compare the right eye and the left eye at two different times, you can see the difference in the involvement and the migration of the lesion in the right eye and the development of the lesion in the left eye. So uh, Heidelberg, as you know, it has a more clear uh, details. As you can see, very clear hyperreflective subretinal change in the right eye. And obviously, uh, there is subretinal uh, uh, deposits in the left eye with a subretinal pigment epithelium hyperreflective change as well. Um, more down the road with multimodal imaging, uh, autofluorescence shows uh, hypo-autofluorescence in both uh, eyes, corresponding to the lesions on the, uh, in the color photo. And uh, fundus fluorescence and geography and uh, ICG shows hypofluorescence in both uh, fundus fluorescence and geography and ICG, corresponding to the lesion here in the right eye, as you can see. Uh, in the left eye as well. As you can see in the ICG, there is diffuse area of macular hypo uh, ICG and multiple small spots of hypo ICG as well. Um, so any thoughts from the audience? Quick thoughts, what was the lesion? Dr. Mandeep, if you have any comment, Dr. Any quick. So now we have no. either uveitis or white dot syndromes, right? Yeah, this is one of the differential uh, diagnoses. Yeah, I agree with you, but there's no any anterior uveitis or posterior uveitis, yeah. Well, choroidal lesion or RB changes, right? It's mainly something Yeah, it's subretinal and subretinal pigmented yes. epithelium lesion. Yes, migrating, okay, uh, in the right eye. Um, not the usual presentation of any other disease, you know, that we think about. Uh, any other suggestions, guys? Uh, Mandeep, you have any suggestions? Well, I think we'll go ahead. I... Yeah. That's what happened to us, actually, when we have seen the patient. It's, Nobody it's, has a clue, you know. Yeah, it's, that is, it's difficult, actually, Victor. It is, exactly. So and we thought about the problem diagnosis. It is, it is unusual, and yeah. migrating this makes the things more difficult. Uh, exactly. And there is no any signs of, of, of RP, RP changes like scars or, or atrophy, you know. So we thought about some different, a uh, big, big list of, 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 of differential diagnosis, sarcoidosis, uh, multifocal choroidosis, as Dr. Nora mentioned, MP, toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis, syphilis, definitely one of these uh, uh, differential diagnoses like uh, posterior placoid, choreotinopathy, metastasis disease, and so on. So everything, we initially, we thought that it was a commercial retina because the history of rotary traffic accident and the white, uh, white lesion in the retina. So we have done inflammatory infective screening, which all of them, they uh, came back uh, normal. So the de decision was uh, uh, to be sent to the FIADS clinic for a second, uh, second opinion. 
But meanwhile, in the, uh, the patient was admitted to another hospital, uh, Christie Hospital in Manchester, as he developed acute confusion and impaired neurological function. An MRI of the brain showed frontal uh, lobe lesion. Lumbar puncture and urgent brain biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of primary CNS lymphoma, B cell lymphoma. So while we were looking at him, the patient, we couldn't figure it out ourselves. Multiple DNAs, but because he developed new uh, neurological symptoms, he attended the Christie Hospital in Manchester where they have done the MRI and they found a frontal lobe lesion. So they went straight ahead for brain biopsy and they found out about the B cell lymphoma. So he underwent chemotherapy and brain and uh, orbital radiotherapy. And this is the ultra wide field images post uh, chemotherapy and with his improvement of vision to six or, uh, over 7.5 in both sides. And you can see there's no any uh, uh, sign of uh, the subretinal changes in, in both eyes. And this is before and post chemotherapy, as you can see disappearance of the hypo autofluorescence uh, with a clear before and after. This is the left eye as well, before and after. Uh, so what makes it difficult to diagnose this gentleman? Why we were really hustled by this gentleman? Definitely the sharp edge of the subretinal fluid, uh, subretinal lesion, and the migration of the lesion in the white eye uh, 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 over time. And there was no any evidence of RP atrophy or scarring or subretinal fibrosis in the previous site. Uh, so it was no normal retina in the previous site. A variability of the clinical presentation as well with the appearance of infiltrate uh, was somewhat unusual and initially didn't raise the suspicion of lymphoma. Uh, multimodal imaging definitely helped to assess, monitor this disease and the response to treatment as we have seen through the OCT, uh, autofluorescence, uh, fundus fluorescence and geography and, and, uh, and uh, ICG. And the take home message from my presentation is lymphoma must be considered in the differential diagnosis of unusual subretinal lesions, even in the absence of any vitreous involvement. So very quick review of the vitreous lymphoma. Primary intraocular lymphoma is a subset of primary CNS lymphoma. It's a raised disease. It's a largely a B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma, and they constitute 46% of primary brain tumors. The median age is between 50 to 60 years old, which fits our patients. And it's more common in females, one to two male to female ratio. And one third of the primary intraocular uh, lymphoma, they have concurrent primary sinus lymphoma at presentation. But consider and leave it in your brain that, in your mind, that 60 to 80 percent of the patients they, uh, they, they present with uh, later with the sinus involvement, like our patients. And this a uh, uh, window of presentation can be from eight to 29 months. Most of the time they're in a specific presentation and aggressive course, and you have to have a very low threshold to, uh, to, 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 uh, to add it in your differential diagnosis list. Uh, uh, Intracranial lymphoma remains one of the greatest masquerading uh, uh, diseases among retinal diseases. Um, and neurological symptoms uh, such as a headache, focal weak weakness, sensory deficits, or confusion can happen at any time. Um, it's more sporadic disease. And the common clinical signs reported included moderate vitritis, which didn't have in our patient, retinal pigment epithelium changes, subretinal infiltrate, which is found in 50% of the patients. And in one large series of intracranial lymphoma, 75% of the patient presented with either anterior or posterior uveitis. And uh, classically or typically, you see vitreous cells which occurs in sheath or clumps. Uh, primary sinus lymphoma should be suspected in any patient with posterior uveitis who has negative workup for common causes of posterior uveitis. And it is commonly that a lot of doctors, when you see these patients, they don't do much of investigation. They start with steroid. They think it's inflammatory uveitis. And this really, it can, uh, uh, it can improve the situation initially but uh, it worsens uh, later on. And this is typical presentation of uh, primary intracranial lymphoma, large yellowish subretinal lesions. This is not in my patient, but this is the typical presentation. which you see it, you didn't think about anything else about, about, uh, other than lymphoma. Uh, and you see clumps of vitreous cells, and if there's any CNS involved, you might uh, be lucky to see a uh, uh, brain lesion in MRI. So diagnosis, vitreous aspiration, but uh, it usually gives a very low yield of uh, lymphoma cells. 
uh, B cells, uh, so multiple biopsies may be required. Uh, the best uh, uh, diagnostic tool is, is diagnostic vitrectomy, is the most common surgical procedure used to confirm a clinical impression of primary intracranial lymphoma. And sometimes you can go down the way to do colorectal biopsy to increase the uh, tumor cells uh, infiltrate in your sample. Definitely immunohistochemistry and flow cytometer looking for blood cell markers. And um, usually in inflammatory uveitis, we see a high level of interleukin-6. But in lymphoma, we see the interleukin-10 higher than interleukin-6. So the ratio between 10 and 6 to be higher than, it would be typically uh, to be higher than 1. Ocular therapy, sometimes we need to do intracular injection of methotrexate or teximab. And, but it does have a high risk of recurrence and you need to have an indefinite uh, follow-up for the patient looking for signs of recurrence. Uh, radiotherapy, like in the gentleman, is, is, is used uh, much less commonly, uh, frequently than, than the past. And sometimes you have to do a whole brain radiation in conjunction with chemotherapy, like in our patients. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarek. It's a very interesting case, and you are elaborate a lot about uh, lymphoma. The, the strange, it's not a clear actually, it's very strange that we are having a, a migration of this presentation from right side temporal to the laser side. That's it's make the, the, the picture is a little bit difficult. Uh, but the question for you, how frequent that we can see uh, lymphoma in uh, cases, uh, and how frequent? Is there any uh, incidence or prevalence for the lymphoma presenting in eye, uh, if you have this information? It, it is very rare, actually. Myself, I've seen maybe two or three cases. I mean, the first case that I've seen was really uh, Can you stop side share, story. Please, yeah. because... stop share, please. Stop oh, sorry, share. Me. Yeah, go stop, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any question for Dr. Tarek from any, any of our here panelists? Very interesting uh, case, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tarek, for this presentation. It was nice to know about that. Huh? Uh, Dr. Anyone? Dr. Mandeep, Dr. Nora, anyone want to ask Dr. Tarek? Otherwise, we... okay. I just feel that Dr. Anora, you want to ask, yes. You have any question, Dr. Anora? Yeah, I do. Because when I okay. was in Canada, I used to see them like, Every two months, I used to see one case, especially if they, they have like retinal detachment. Uveitis colleague, they, they used to send them uh, for us to do vitreous biopsy, and sometimes we have positive results. But here in UAE, I have never seen any case. So I don't think it's very common in our, uh, in our country or our culture, like, not like the, uh, the Caucasian European. population. Yeah, exactly. So they used to have it. That's why if you have a patient with uveitis like picture, you need to do investigation. If investigation is positive, you need to think about the tree biopsy, not to jump to treatment immediately. Even we can do like choroidal subretinal biopsy as well. And sometimes we can even do retinal biopsy if needed to confirm the diagnosis of those patients. You mean this one only in difficult cases that where we cannot find the causes? Yes, before. exactly. Because you yeah. can't start just a random treatment for those patients. You do more harm than helping the patient for uh, recovering from their uh, diseases. Uh, thank you for your comments. And uh, now it is your time. So now I'll introduce Dr. Honora. She will present one case. Dr. Honora is a veterinary veterinary surgeon in SKMC Khalifa Hospital. Okay, I'll share again my presentation. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, please yes. go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, and Thank for you. giving this uh, for giving me this opportunity to be able to present and discuss one one interactive case between you and the colleagues. So uh, my presentation is about pushing boundaries and uh, DME. Um, I work in Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Abu Dhabi, UAE. So, history, he's a 33-year-old male, known case of uncontrolled diabetes type 2 for 14 years. He's hypertensive, dyslipidemia, and treatment. So, he presented to our clinic with bilateral progressive loss of, of 
uh, best corrected uh, visual acuity. And his vision was uh, 2200 in the right eye and 2100 in the left eye. And he's phakic with severe and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And this is his OCT. And uh, I think any one of us will immediately call him as a diabetic macular edema and he will, we will start him with an anti-VGF uh, treatment. So this patient was started an anti-VGF treatment and this is his OCT after uh, one injection. His right eye improved to 2080 and left eye improved to 2070. And this patient was started on uh, aflipercept as primary treatment. And you can see from the OCT, there is a, a vitro-retinal interface changes. There is exudates, there is cystic changes in the left eye with um, some exudates as well and some thickening of the posterior hyoid. So this is his OCT after uh, third inj uh, after three injection of uh, aflipercept and his vision is uh, improving slowly to 2080 and 2050, which is, uh, I consider it as a very nice uh, improvement in the visual acuity. And the OCT is improving slightly and slowly, especially in his uh, right eye. And this is his uh, OCT after six injection, the vision in the right eye is 2040, which is a very nice response to aflipercept, and 2030 in the left eye. Still the uh, vitro-retinal interface, now I think you can see them better because uh, the resolving uh, macular edema. So this is his OCT in the right eye after eight injection, and you can notice uh, his vision is dropping in his left eye to 2200. And in the, le uh, in the right eye, 2200, left eye, 20, uh, 2030, which is a good vision for the left eye, but the right eye is showing some uh, deterioration of the vision. And even in the OCT, you can see thickening of the vitro-retinal um, interface, some uh, changes in the surface of the retina as well. There is some tractional component. And I think in this stage, you should, you should think about vitro-retinal interface diseases, and you should switch to other uh, modality of treatments. So uh, this patient was booked for uh, right eye uh, pars plana vitrectomy with epiretinal membrane eye and peeling. And especially in cases of diabetic, you need, before you go in the eye, you have to keep in mind, this is a very long standing uh, diabetic, there's a very long standing diabetic macular edema. This retina might be ischemic. The, the retina will be very fragile and the posterior hyaloid will be very stuck to the retina. So you need to take all the precaution and all the co surgical consideration during this, um, this surgery. And if you have the luxury of having intraoperative OCT, it will help you a lot to know about the status of the retina after removing the ILM and the membrane. And be careful about light toxicity. This retina is very sensitive to light. To, to, so start to um, change your light uh, accordingly. And don't forget about the perfusion. This retina was um, in very bad perfusion status. So don't uh, try to manipulate your intraoperative uh, pressure uh, to high perfusion because you might kill the nerve. So during peeling, uh, be very gentle, be very slow, do very uh, good work to avoid full thickness macular hole. And uh, some cases they might have a very worsening of their macular edema due to aggressive manipulation of the retina. This is a small video showing how to do ILM peeling. This is not the same video of the patient, but just a small video to show you how we do ILM peeling on those patients. And they might bleed, which is, uh, normal and diabetic patient, they tend to have um, easy, a problem with their coagulation and they might bleed. That's why you don't have to play a lot with the intraoperative pressure in those cases. So a vitro-retinal interface and diabetic macular edema, always keep them in your mind because uh, the reason why diabetic, they have those kind of uh, different presentation, their retina is due to the disease vitreous. So always keep in mind, if you notice a poor response to anti-VGF, think about vitromacular adhesion, vitromacular traction, and epiretinal membrane, because this is a very well-documented in the uh, 
literature that if uh, those patients, they do tend to respond poorly to anti-VGF treatment. And this is our patient after uh, uh, one month from the surgery. And you can notice there is some cystic changes. And always keep in your mind, uh, doing ILM peeling for those patients can, there is a rebound cystic changes. So you don't have to jump and start them in anti-VGF treatment, give them some time. And, uh, and you can notice this is his, uh, his OCT after three months from the treatment and his vision improved nicely to 2060. And uh, you can notice the cystic changes started to resolve slowly. He started to, see some, uh, to show some nasal uh, uh, intraretinal fluid. And this is his left eye. He was 2040 in the left eye after nine injection. And fortunately, this, this photo was taken in March and uh, I don't have any recent um, picture of the patient because he missed follow up due to this COVID uh, problem. So what if you notice the cystic changes? Keep in mind there is a rebound cystic changes immediate post-op period due to ILM peeling. And uh, if there is a recurrent uh, diabetic macular edema, especially in vitrectomized eye, anti-VGF, there is a decrease bioavailability of the medication. So instead of staying for one month, this medication will stay only for two months. That's why if you give anti-VGF and you see the patient after you, one month, you, mo you might notice deterioration of the disease because this, this medication did not stay for longer period like in uh, non-vitrectomized eye. So start to think about longer acting intravitreal implant, either steroid, and hopefully we'll have this new uh, slow re releasing of anti-VGF implant in the vitreous. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nora, for your uh, nice presentation case. Uh, I think there is uh, many questions for you. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Tar here, you have asked, Dr. Tara? Yeah, yes. Okay, so Dr. Nora, she, she go to a surgery in this case. What do you think? You saw the case? Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, uh, I can ask you a question, uh, Dr. Nora. He is diabetic, yes. he's 33 years old and diabetic type 2 for 15 years. Yes. All right, so he started to be diabetic type 2 at 50 years or 40, yeah. 40, 40 yeah. 15 years. Yeah, he was yeah. in yeah. medication and insulin, yeah. Uh, we have this, yeah, I have yeah, seen exactly. a 14 year old with type 2 diabetes. So you're lucky that you have, you are able to go to the posterior lamella, isn't it, in this age group? Because 33 years you would have, uh, the, the vitreous exactly. is, is very adherent to the, to the retina. Exactly, yes. That's why you need uh, yeah. to be very careful not to create any regmatogenous stairs during the surgery. Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, how about uh, the, the indication of doing the surgery in this case while you are having, uh, uh, there is a little bit, uh, you can say, attraction and uh, uh, posterior face, little bit thickening. Um, if the vision is not deteriorating much, do you think you will go for surgery, Dr. Anona, or you just continue giving injection and follow up the patient? I think I will be very keen. I will just wait and keep injecting the patient instead of jumping for surgery because diabetic uh, vitrectomy is very hard, especially in those diabetic cases. But okay, his vision deteriorate. It, it was a very big deterioration of the vision with more, more traction in the retina. Um, okay, Dr. Mandib, you have seen this patient. If you are the one who is treating, you will go for surgery? Yeah, absolutely, because... Um... What I understood from Dr. Noura's presentation is actually, despite of the intervital injections, the vision in this patient was dropping and there was a clear tinting through the posterior halide. Uh, I mean, if I this patient she... drops, if the patient, according to that, what I, I'm talking about, just uh, I'm not judging Dr. Noura about the discussion and decision, but I'm just, uh, just highlight about the points. Uh, if this patient is, you give him again uh, an anti vgf and he improve, well, till he's improving, I will go ahead with anti -vigifs. Till he is improving. There, there is a stage which comes in fractional uh, diabetic macular edemas when they stop improving. The macular edema actually starts resolving and that's when you start seeing the tinting of the, of the posterior halide and the traction which clearly was evident in this, this particular OCT. So definitely once it stops to re recover and the vision is uh, somewhere around 
six eighteen or six. Uh, let's say six eighteen. I will go ahead with the surgery. No doubt about it. Uh, any comment, Doctor Nora, before we move? Thank you for your nice presentation. Excellent. I, I just have a question for Doctor Nora. Uh, there's always a talk about uh, a surgeon creating an heterogeneic macular hole in such okay. cases. Something I have never seen, but people obviously talk about it. In my experiences, what more often happens is these patients have tendency to develop macular holes later on because of you know foveal atrophy and they just you know they might present to you after three or four years of doing well and they come back with chronic macular holes with very bad uh, edges of the macular holes. What what is your experience? I mean, in both the scenarios. I have you know. I have seen full thickness macular hole immediately in the post op period, and this depends on the, how experienced the surgeon in doing the surgery. If you are if you are not sure and uh, you can do like foveal sparing, ILM peeling, you don't have to peel the ILM over the fovea, just leave it. And this will avoid having full thickness macular hole. And they have seen extra foveal macular hole, I think from how the way, the way people are pinching the retina to create the ILM flap. And those cases, I think, especially in diabetic, it will be very hard to treat this patient and you don't have any other thing to close the, this macular hole. Maybe you can do peel more ILM, do neurosensory retinal uh, transplantation, but they tend to do very poor, especially in diabetic patients. Exactly. And this is, there is a new, uh, uh, the, the, the loop, Alcon loop, which is, uh, I forget the name, Fnissen loop. I think it's very gentle in the retina to create the flab. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's very gentle in the retina to create the, the flab and to complete even your ILM peeling, especially for people with less experience in uh, macular work. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Una, Dr. Mandeep, and Dr. Tarek for this event. Uh, now we'll have uh, Lima for presentation. Uh, Lima, you can go ahead. Lima is a, a medical uh, uh, responsible about, I think, GALP in the Bavaria. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Amri. You can hear me well, right? Yes, yes. Go ahead, Lima. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, as uh, introduced by, by Dr. Amri, for, who, for those who don't know me, my name is Lima. I'm uh, from the medical uh, team of uh, Bayer, responsible for the GALP, for the ophthalmology. Uh, actually, uh, I'm really glad to be part of uh, uh, this uh, amazing speakers and this for sure amazing moderator. Thank you, Dr. Amri, for this opportunity uh, for Bayer to be hosting and even presenting in such important uh, webinar. And also uh, on behalf of my colleagues on the call and Razan, um, again, we would like to, uh, to thank you and to present not for more than 10 minutes. So Dr. Amri, I know you are very strict on time. So if you find me uh, going beyond time, please just let me know one minute before before my time so that I can finish uh, sharply. No worries, no worries, go ahead. This no is, Take this is actually one of the advantages of the virtual meetings is that we start and we finish on time. So that's great. Uh, today in my presentation, I don't want to be talking about clinical trials and all of that. I wanted to be discussing uh, also a point or, or uh, uh, the main objective of my uh, 10 minutes uh, presentation is to, to talk about the same topic which my colleagues or the other respectful uh, speakers were talking about, which is the cases, the real life cases. I can't present cases because of, obviously I'm not a practitioner, but what I want to present in my uh, short uh, lecture is um, the real life practice all around the world with anti-VEGF. Uh, so um, starting with, with the concept of the real world evidence. Real world evidence is obviously very important. Uh, uh, we can find some disparity between randomized clinical trial and real world evidence. Sometimes we, we, we see the randomized clinical trial of some of the drugs and we expect that we will find the same results in the real world when we use them in our cases, but unfortunately we don't see the same. Um, what about aflibercept and what about other anti Um If we look at the real world evidence since maybe 20 years or even more till today, the need and the interest in real world evidence is increasing dramatically, especially in the uh, last five years. 
What about buyer? Buyer contribution in the real world evidence um, in the retinal uh, disorders and especially in DME is also increasing. We are very interested in the real world evidence that till today there is around 25,000 patients that were uh, recruited in our real world evidence only for the aptic macular edema. And you can imagine that it's triple and even more than triple in AMD, because as you know, AMD in Europe and in US is much more prevalent than DME. So they have a lot of real life evidence there on AMD. But for us, we are definitely interested on uh, in DME because it's around 90% of the cases that is being seen between the macular edema or, or between the retinal disorders. Uh, I'm actually even happy to announce, uh, which I believe many of the doctors on the call and from the speakers, they already know that we have even a real world evidence going on here in, in, in UAE and in the Gulf, in the Middle East, which is called um, Origa. And hopefully whenever we have um, some evidence or some data, we will be sharing it with you very soon. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, my uh, presentation that unfortunately there is some disparity between real world evidence and the promise in the real, uh, in the randomized clinical trial. Like if we look at previous anti vgf if we look at Ancor Marina, which is very known well-known uh, uh, ran uh, randomized clinical trial in AMD or CAT Harbor, we can see that there are a lot of um, uh, optimistic uh, 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 vision improvement which were seen with ranibizumab, which was really, really uh, interesting uh, to see in the, in, in the randomized clinical trial for the vision improvement. While when we look at the real world evidence, there was unfortunately decline in the um, uh, vision um, uh, improvement in the real world evidence, maybe because uh, also of um, the uh, less compliance and less uh, proactive dosing, which uh, uh, is being given in the real uh, life practice. Like if we look at the randomized clinical trial, it was almost monthly dosing in AMD for sure, while in the real life, it's around five injection per year which this decline in the number of injection made this maybe disparity between the real world evidence and the randomized clinical trial. What about Aflibercept? What about ILEA? If we look at the real um, world evidence or real world studies compared to the randomized clinical trial, we can see more or less the same uh, vision improvement almost. And for the um, uh, number of injection, it's almost also the same, maybe a little bit less in the real world evidence. So when we are uh, uh, giving the drug in the right way proactively, I know that there is a lot of reasons why, why the patient, he doesn't come to his appointment or the insurance or many reasons that make uh, 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 make us uh, or make the physicians unable to give the right loading dose and the right uh, dosing regimen. However, when we are giving it in the right way, we can see that the vision improvement is impressive. What about the diabetic macular edema? We know that diabetic macular edema is more challenging in the management because there is other reasons why the patient doesn't improve, maybe because of the, his uh, HbA1c control, maybe because of the lipidemia, maybe of the hypertension, maybe there is some other reasons, mainly the glucose um, uh, management. So we can expect that the real world evidence that we will see with anti-VGF will be different from the randomized clinical trial. So let me introduce our real world evidence in DME for aflibercept, starting with the first published real world evidence, which we had in 2018. It's called Campus Polo. It was done in Spain and it was only on 30 uh, eyes or 29 eyes. Uh, the patients who were recruited were naive patients, new patients, and they were giving the right loading dose. When the patient took five loading do dose with aflibercept, they gained around 13 letters when they were giving the right loading dose. 13 letters, if we remember, I think Dr. Ram, Mandeep presented it, it was the same almost number that we have seen in protocol T. Again, we have done another real-world evidence, but that was in UK, in Moorfields. It's called Lukic. Lukic, the patient who were recruited, also they gained 13.8 letters after the first year. But which patient 
the patient who were less than 69, which is again the same message which I think Dr. Al-Amri and Dr. Mandeep and even Dr. Tare and uh, Dr. Noura mentioned that those patients, we can expect that aflibercept will give a uh, much faster and more significant improvement. And what's the reason? Simply because those patients have more room of improvement. So you can see the differences between the three on TVGF or between the treatments. While the patient who were better than 69, which is let's say 20 over 30, for example, or 20 over 25, those patients, they gain 2.6 letters, but anyways, they can't gain more easily because already there is the ceiling effect. The first year, in this randomized, uh, in this, sorry, real world evidence, the patient took 7.4 injections, while the second and the third year, they took only 2.7 or three injection. So when we started proactively with, let's say aggressive treatment with the correct loading dose, the number of injection was dramatically in, in decreased, while the vision improvement or the number of letters was almost the same. So we could maintain it. Um, the last two real world evidence, which I would like to present before my time is over, is this fight retina blindness registry. This one is very interesting. First of all, because FRB is very well known. It's one of the very um, uh, reliable real world evidence that we see. It's a registry that's been done in Australia and many other countries. This is the first reason why it's important. The other reason is that it's head to head. And rarely we see head-to-head -head between, um, between uh, uh, treatments in the real-world evidence. These patients were less than 68, which is, again, the same stratification or the same group, which we have discussed in the uretinal guidelines and in other uh, uh, evidence. Those patients gained significantly more vision with aflibercept with 10.6 letters compared to the other group, ranibzumab, 0.5 milligram with 7.6 letters, while the number of injection with aflibercept was eight compared to six. However, this was non-significant difference in the number of injection, while the vision was significantly um, well higher with, with aflibercept two milligram compared to ranibizumab 0.5 milligram. Maybe, maybe also because that aflibercept label is very clear in DME, it's not PRN, it's five loading dose, then every other month in the first year, then in the second year, it's treat and extend. So that makes the, the physician maybe um, use it more proactively because our recommendation as buyer team is very clear in that. The last uh, slide which I would like to share is the other real world evidence. It's the recent one. It's called Apollon. Apollon um, uh, uh, in France, it's presented or, or uh, published just uh, recently. And the interesting point about Apollon is that it compared the treatment naive with the switcher. And this is again, uh, it's reliable or, or consistent with what Dr. Mandeep uh, presented in his lecture uh, when there was a situation in, in his uh, uh, center that they, they couldn't uh, have uh, uh, aflibercept as first line and they were uh, switching the other patient who are non-responder to aflibercept. In this real world evidence, this is the same what, what was presented. Because some patients, which are around 30% of the patient, they were switcher previously treated with either laser or ranibizumab. Those patients gained five letters after the first year. Compared to the treatment naive, which obviously they will gain more letter because we are treating them early and we are treating them intensively before there is any chronic uh, problem, those patients gained 7.8 letters. If we compare this Apollon with VIVID, which is our randomized clinical trial, because the, the topic of my lecture is mirroring real world evidence into randomized clinical trial. And this paragraph or this graph, sorry, answers this question. If we compare the Apollon, which is real world evidence, to VIVID, which is randomized clinical trial, the patient gained different number of letters, but they achieved the same outcome, which is 70 letters. So both the group, either the ones which previously treated in VIVID with aflibercept, 
gain 10.7 letters and reach 70. And those patients in Apollon gain 7.8 letters and reach again 70. This is for sure two different trials and it's not intended for direct comparison, but I'm just trying to drive some, some uh, trend that the patient, we need to make him reach the maximum vision, which is 70 letters. Why 70 letters is important for the patient? 70 letters is around 20 over 40 uh, or better for sure. Those patients will be able to drive to read the newsletter as showing as showing in the in the in the slide here, and even they can manage their diabetes control, their other comorbidities without the need of of any help because they will be their vision will be will be almost perfect. Um, I didn't want to summarize my presentation with any wording saying that. Uh, well, uh, our real-world evidence is mirroring uh, RCTs and that aflibercept can be drug choice. I didn't want to, to summarize it in that way. I just wanted to summarize it in this slide that at the end of the day, your objective for sure is the patient. And um, as shown in the randomized clinical trial and in the real-world evidence, uh, if we aim with the proactive dosing to reach the maximum, which is better than 20 over 40 vision or even 20 over 20, this hopefully can be achieved for, for, for sure if there is no other uh, problems there. Um, with the proactive dosing, with the five loading dose, then every other month, if it's possible, and if the patient has reached the maximum vision earlier, then we don't need for sure to be proactive because already the patient reached the maximum, and we need just to be uh, maintaining this, uh, this uh, vision improvement so that patient can enjoy his quality of life back again. And that's it for my for my presentation. Uh, thank you, Lima. Uh, excellent presentation, actually, and you summarize a lot of points. Uh, I don't know if someone wants to ask Lima or to highlight about certain points. Well, thank actually, you very much, Lima, for the presentation. Thank you. Any thank question you. for Lima? Okay, thank you, Lima. Uh, I think there is, you already mentioned a very important comparison and you highlight a lot of certain points that's very important. And you show the real things that we are in the real life is completely different than what we are seeing in the uh, study. And that's good that you, you make a mirror, as you mentioned, that's in Aflipercept actually, uh, what is uh, seen and found in the study almost uh, seen also in the real life because it was a real and it was clear how to use the medications, especially in treatment of the big macular edema. Uh, thank you, uh, Lima, and thanks for all. Uh, and in this, by this, we are going to conclude the first session and we will have to start the, our second session, which is a pediatric. And today we are having a three uh, eminent speakers and also uh, moderators, Dr. Uh, Ihab al Babli will be also uh, moderating with me these sessions. Uh, before I start, I will give the mic to my dear colleague Ihab to just to have uh, an introduction talking about Eucoporia within two minutes before we start with our uh, presenters. Uh, hello, dear. So we are going to speak today about Eucoporia uh, dealing mainly with congenital cataract with Dr. Nihal and coronary manifestation or association with the congenital cataract with Dr. Asim, as well as the mascarat or retinal blastoma, which is a serious condition. Uh, Dr. Khan is going to speak about it here. Uh, Leukocoria, as you all know, is a white pupil. It is often uh, seen by family members uh, or by in flash photography. Any patient with an abnormal red reflex should be evaluated promptly by an ophthalmologist. Uh, the most common condition which causes leukocoria, as you know, is the congenital cataract or cataract, uh, retinoblastoma, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, endophthalmitis or endo uh, intraocular infection, retinal detachment, or uh, retinal vascular abnormalities such as Coats disease. So all these conditions can cause leukocoria represent a serious threat to vision and some pose a threat to life. So uh, any patient, so a prompt yeah, evaluation of leukocoria by an ophthalmologist is, also, is always appropriate. 
the it is very important to take a detailed history and do a good ophthalmic examination as well as an auxiliary test, uh, which is essential for uh, evaluating patients with, leuco with leukocoria. Age of onset, uh, the average age of onset for diagnosis of retinal blastoma is 18 months, and the age of onset for both disease is five years. You have to ask about a history of prematurity as you may have uh, total retinal detachment or what we used to say retrolentar fibroblasia. Uh, trauma is very important to ask about as it can cause cataract, vitreous hemorrhage, yeah, or retinal detachment. Yeah. You have to ask about arthritis as uh, you may have aeuveitis with hypopion, which can mimic uh, retinoblastoma. Uh, other systemic diseases like tuberous sclerosis uh, can be associated with astrocytoma, which uh, induce as well a, a leukocoria or white red reflex. A family history of retinoblastoma, as you know, is 10% uh, of uh, patients with retinoblastoma have a family history of the disease. Some other uh, vitroretinal retinopathy as familiar exudative vitroretinopathy is associated with autosomal dominant inheritance. Coloboma of uh, the disc yeah, is uh, as well as cause uh, white uh, pupils or a leukocoria, and it is a familiar condition. So while doing a clinical examination, it is not only to do a red reflex to see the leukocoria, it is very important to examine the anterior segment of the eye to differentiate between the, if it's cataract or the leukocoria is due to a, a posterior uh, vitreous or retinal detachment. So dilatation of the pupil in all kids, especially if they have uh, strabismus yeah, or visual uh, uh, disturbance is essential as you can see a uh, retinal blastoma I think it is two minutes are okay. And now we can start with Dr. Nihal, yeah, who is going to give us information about pediatric cataract, as well as uh, we'd like to know here the indication of the surgical the, so, uh, and surgical approach for congenital cataract and some other details about uh, her good experience about so regarding the congenital cataract. Please, Dr. Nair, you can start now. Is it uh, obvious, the screen? Yes, go ahead, Doctora. yes. Very good. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm gonna speak about the congenital cataract surgery. As actually, since the time is very limited, so I'm gonna give some surgical uh, tips in management of straightforward cataract uh, cases, congenital cataract cases. Uh, and actually the talk is dedicated to uh, young um, ophthalmologists uh, performing the straightforward congenital cataract uh, surgery. As we all know, congenital cataract is still a debatable issue concerning the timing of surgery, concerning the technique, whether to go through anterior or posterior approach in these cases, and also after surgery, uh, are we going to fit with the spectacles or are we gonna implant at the age of IOL implantation? Also, uh, the choice of the frames and the choice of the glasses in these infants. So, I, uh, as I told you, I will only speak about one point, is the surgical tips in management of cases with and without IOL implantation. To start with cataract surgery with IOL implantation. In these infants, I'd like to start with a side port first, and then introduction of the viscoelastic, and then the other side port, and finally the main wound. Why? Because when we penetrate the eye by the main wound first, there will be a sudden collapse of the anterior chamber. We close the pupil 
and definitely you're going to touch the iris during the surgery, which will increase the risk of inflammation after surgery. Anterior capsulorexis. To avoid this terrible picture of capsular phimosis, I use trypan blue stain in only total cataract in order to make a sort of a contrast between the uh, anterior capsule and the, co and the cortex. And our aim, since we are going to implant intraocular lens, to perform exactly five millimeter anterior rexis. Here and I, without stain and after stain, and then we use the micro rexis scissors in these children and infants, and it's usually 25 or 23 gauge to perform, as I told you, five millimeter anterior rexis. We start by the cystitone. We make a sort of a small paracentral incision in the anterior lens capsule. And then with a micro rexis, we go with the rexis uh, forceps like that. We pull tangential. And sometimes we have to pull towards the center as we know that the anterior capsule is extremely elastic. And at the end, we have a name to perform a five millimeter anterior rexis. Sometimes when you have cases like that of a lamellar opacity, we all know that the lamellar opacity is five millimeter in diameter. So it's gonna be a beautiful landmark while performing anterior capsule rexis. After performing the tear, we use the micro rexis forceps like this, and we take it as a landmark and you see here, this is the edge of the rexis, and we perform a beautiful anterior rexis at the edge of the lamellar opacity. This will be exactly five millimeters. If we have a total lamellar opacity like that, total opacification of the lamellar uh, cataract, we can perform the rexis just outside the lamellar opacity against the red reflex in order to have, again, this beautiful five millimeter anterior rexis. Why exactly five anterior rexis? In order after IOL implantation, as you all know that the IOL optic is six millimeter in diameter. So when we perform anterior rexis, just five, it's gonna be inside the optic and it will cover the optic 360 degrees. If we perform less than five millimeter anterior rexis, definitely in the future, we're gonna have a capsular phimosis. So what to do? We have to enlarge this anterior capsular rexis. How? We cut with the scissors the edge of the anterior rexis, small tear like that. And then again, with the rexis forceps, we can enlarge it to the desired five millimeter anterior rexis. Hydrodissect. We go with the cannula just underneath the anterior capsule at six o'clock position. And we proceed downward to the, towards six o'clock position. And then we should elevate the anterior capsule and then inject. You will not see a wave. You will not see disturbance of the, uh, uh, the lens matter here. You will just see uh, viscoelastic coming outside the wound. This will ensure that you have a perfect hydrodissection and then hydrodelineation. But take care in some infants and children, especially with deeply seated opacities like that. If you look here, there is a circular edge of a posterior capsule defect. In these cases, contraindication to go for hydrodissection. This line coincides with a large posterior capsule defect. If you go for hydrodissection in these cases, definitely you will push all lens matter and it will fall down into the posterior segment, increasing the incidence of vitritis and secondary glaucoma later on. So in instance with bilateral congenital cataract, you have to look to the morphology perfectly. Look here to, in the left eye, can you see this delineation here under the microscope? This line delineates a posterior capsule defect. So you have to look to the morphology perfectly before going to surgery. Irrigation aspiration. You have to go for a meticulous irrigation aspiration in order to decrease the risk of secondary cataract in the future. 
than polishing the back surface of the anterior capsule. You have to remove all lens epithelial cells from the back surface of the cornea. It is very important step in infants. Maybe it's not that important in adults. Look here, this part of the capsule is been polished perfectly, and this part is not yet polished. These are remnants of lens epithelial cells that have to be removed totally. This part of the anterior capsule is polished, but this part is not yet polished. You have to polish it until you have a crystal clear anterior capsule. And here with magnification, and here with more magnification, there is no lens epithelial cells on the back surface of the anterior capsule. Why? In order to have a clear anterior capsule after surgery, because if we don't polish the anterior capsule, definitely you're gonna have fibrosis of the anterior capsule like that, which will prevent good visualization of the retina if you need it in the future. And if it is less than four millimeter and without polishing, capsular phimosis will occur, obstructing the visual axis, and definitely you will need a secondary surgical intervention to clear the visual axis. And sometimes you have a beautiful surgery like this. Years after surgery, this is the anterior axis and posterior axis, but the anterior capsule was not polished perfectly. What happened? Lens epithelial cells did grow from the back surface of the anterior capsule over the anterior surface of the lens, partially obstructing the visual axis. And here, after aspiration of the pearls of the anterior surface of the lens, can you see here, this is the posterior axis and anterior vitrectomy, it was done perfect. But the polishing of, of the back surface of the anterior capsule was deficient. Posterior capsular axis. There's important tip in posterior capsular axis. When you inject it with the viscoelastic, it should be uh, minimal and not too much. You have to have the iris, the anterior lens capsule and posterior capsule all in one plane. Don't fill the posterior, the, the capsular back with viscoelastic. And then with the cystitone, you hook the posterior capsule. This is called hooking. And then you tent the anterior capsule, tenting. You pull it anteriorly, and then you tear the posterior capsule into a triangular tear. It should be triangular. If it is circular, it means that you opened the anterior vitreous space and vitreous did prolapse into the anterior chamber. And then through this triangular tear, you inject viscoelastic, you don't dip into the anterior vitreous. At the edge of the uh, tear like that, you inject viscoelastic into the burger space. It will appear with a circular halo like this. And then injection more, enlargement of the sulfuric halo. If you see this picture, irregularity in the vitreous, it means that you did penetrate the anterior vitreous space and you did inject the viscoelastic into the vitreous and this will make the posterior capsorexis difficult to perform. This is another case, hooking of the posterior capsule, tenting and then tearing into a triangular tear. Through this triangular tear, you inject the viscoelastic. If you can see here, this is the circular halo. And here, increase in size, more increase in size. And then you hold the capsule with a microrexis forceps. It's gonna be very simple and very easy to perform exactly four millimeter posterior rexis. Anterior vitrectomy. You don't wanna see this terrible picture you don't want to see this terrible picture of vitreous in the anterior chamber. So how to perform the good anterior vitrectomy? Start first by a dry vitrectomy and then introduce the irrigation. You, you don't need to stain the anterior vitreous face with, with uh, steroids in order to see the vitreous because you can see it perfectly the effect of the vitreous. See here, there is kinking of the posterior rexis. So you can easily go again with dry vitrectomy. This is not enough. There is still remnants of the vitreous in the anterior chamber. 
again drive a tractomy until you have a perfectly circular posterior cataraxis like that. What is the extent of the anterior vitrectomy? You have to remove a good part of the anterior vitreous, a saucer-like part. You even go beyond the edge of the posterior capsorexis and you go and dip at 12 o'clock position. Why you have to remove a good part of anterior vitreous? Because years after surgery, lens epithelial cells may grow over remnants of the anterior vitreous face and sometimes may totally obstruct the visual axis despite having a posterior capsorexis. But here, when you have a good vitrectomy, years after surgery, you have a clear visual axis. Lens epithelial cells did stop at the edge of the posterior capsorexis. And in cases even with small posterior capsorexis, but with good anterior vitrectomy, you have a clear visual axis along the years. The type of IL implantation and the technique. First, you inflate the capsular back with viscoelastic, and we can use both intraocular lens. Hydrophobic acrylic lenses, either a single piece, we inject it into uh, the capsular bag. It has the advantage that it unfolds slowly and can be placed easily between the anterior and posterior rexes or we can use the multi-piece intraocular lens. And the important thing about it that the lower haptic should underlie the anterior capsorexis and then unfolding, you can rotate it with a Y-shaped spatula easily between the anterior and posterior rexis or another technique, which is a simple one, introduce the lower haptic and then the haptic optic junction on the right side here, you push it until the intraocular lens, the optic is inside the capsular bag. The second step is that you get the haptic midway between the haptic optic junction and the tip of the haptic. Here, this is a Y-shaped spatula. You push forward until the, the whole optic inside the capsular bag. When you leave the haptic, it will be placed easily between the anterior and posterior rexes. So we can implant either multi-piece or single piece intraocular lens inside the capsular bag between the two anterior and posterior rexes. And finally, the wound should be closed. These are examples of single piece intraocular lens few weeks after surgery, few months after surgery, anterior and posterior rexes with clear visual access. Here again, Years after surgery, lens epithelial cells start to grow, but we have clear visual axis. Years after surgery, lens epithelial cells 360 degrees, but we have again clear visual axis. See, this is lens epithelial cells, and this is the anterior and posterior rexes. This is five years after surgery, lens epithelial cells very extensive, but again, clear visual axis, severe lens epithelial cells, but you have a good posterior axis and anterior vitrectomy. This is a night 10 years after surgery, colonies of lens epithelial cells, but again with clear visual axis. And these are examples of multi-piece intraocular lens between the anterior and posterior capsorexis few months after surgery. Years after surgery, lens epithelial cells respect the posterior rexes here five years after surgery and 10 years after surgery. Extensive fibrosis and extensive pearls, but we have clear visual access is maintained along the years. The second uh, type of surgery is cataract surgery without IOL implantation. And this, is, uh, this surgery is done in infants below the age of two years. Whom undergo cataract surgery and gonna be fitted with AFEC spectacles. I go for surgery through corneal ones. I prefer the anterior approach with an MVR knife 30 gauge, 20 gauge, sorry. It means that the wound size is 0.9 millimeter. I use trepan blue stain in total cataract in order to perform here a six millimeter rexis and not five. After performing a six millimeter anterior capsorexis, we perform the posterior axis. This again, uh, another case, we go with a para uh, central 
tear like that here in the anterior capsule. And then with the microrexis forceps, we go for a six millimeter anterior capsorexis. It usually tends to escape, but frequent regrasping until we perform exactly six millimeter anterior capsorexis. Then hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, irrigation, aspiration, and then posterior capsorexis again, hooking, tenting, and tearing into a triangular tear. This is the triangular tear injection of viscoelastic into the burger's face and then perform the posterior axis. But here we are not going to implant. So again, the size of the posterior capsular axis should be exactly six millimeter. So we have a six millimeter anterior axis and a six millimeter posterior capsular axis. Then anterior retractomy, and finally we close the wounds. Why exactly five millimeter and five millimeter, uh, sorry, six and six millimeter? and not the conventional five and four. Because if we make the conventional five millimeter and four millimeter rexes, by time when the anterior and posterior capsule fuse together, they form a ring, capsular phimosis will occur. And sometimes it is severe like that, necessitating secondary surgery to clear the visual axis. Look here, there is capsular phimosis after pediatric cataract surgery because the anterior and posterior axes were smaller than six millimeters. So we had to go with the micro scissors to cut the capsular ring and then perform vitrectomy to clear the visual axis again. And why not larger than six millimeter? Because larger than six millimeter, the capsular ring will retract. So smaller than Six millimeter, the anterior and posterior capsule will make capsular phimosis. Larger than six millimeter, they will retract. After retraction, this is gonna make the secondary IOL implantation very difficult. Look here at time of secondary IOL implantation, the capsular ring did retract, it did retract. So at time of secondary IOL implantation, as in this case, after dilatation, this is the capsular ring it is far and it is quite difficult to implant the eye well in sulcus and rotate it. So it will be quite difficult. But when we go for six millimeter anterior axis, six millimeter posterior axis and good anterior vitrectomy, also it's very important for this anterior vitrectomy to perform. Why? Because look here, inadequate anterior vitrectomy uh, lens epithelial cells will grow over the anterior vitreous face and sometimes will obstruct the visual axis despite having a beautiful anterior and posterior rexes. So to conclude, anterior capsorexis in these infants should be six millimeters, posterior capsorexis should be six millimeters with a good anterior retractomy. And in these infants by time, capsule will, will, will go like that, it will shrink a little bit, it will be a beautiful capsular support for future secondary IOL implantation. You may implant the multi-piece intraocular lens in sulcus and it is supported by a beautiful capsular ring. And in some cases, when the capsular ring is thin like this, after implantation of the IOL in sulcus, you may perform optic capture technique having all advantages of capsular IOL, and it's, it, it doesn't touch the iris, and it's beautifully centered. And after surgery, we fit the babies with these AFEC spectacles, and we like this type of frames. It is all plastic, and it covers the eyebrow of the infants, and there is no joints. And we use in these infants lenticular glasses, uh, which uh, fits perfectly, even in the preterm babies, after performing pediatric cataract surgery. And these are just some surgical tips when dealing with the congenital cataract in order to have a safe and sound surgeries for these beautiful angels without any complications. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. for your presentations and excellent as usual. Uh, we didn't miss even one second of your presentation because it was an inter I mean, interesting and it was 
uh, well uh, organized and attractive. Um, if there is any question for Dr. from Dr. Ihab, you want to ask Dr. Yeah, we uh, have two minutes. Yes, Dr. Nihal. So, uh, is it possible? I can't hear you, Dr. Ihab. Dr. Ihab, you are mute. You are mute. Uh, Dr. Nihal, thank you very much for the nice presentation, Dr. Nihal. Very fantastic uh, as usual. Uh, is it possible to do uh, sulcus implantation in pediatric cases as a first, not intercapsular? Uh, it is better, of course, to go for a, a primary areal implantation inside the capsular bag, but sometimes you are faced to implant in sulcus. Uh, uh, but how to avoid this? For example, if you lose, uh, lose the posterior capsule, if you have a congenital posterior capsule defect, which is quite large, you may implant in sulcus and perform optic capture technique. So the key of success of pediatric cataract surgery is the anterior capsorexis. If you have anterior capsorexis exactly five millimeter and central, no problem. Whatever problem you're gonna face, it has a solution. You can implant in sulcus over this five millimeter anterior capsorexis and then push the optic behind the capsular, this uh, anterior capsule, you will have optic capture technique. Uh, the IOL will be away from the back surface of uh, the iris and has all the advantage of capsular IOL. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctora. Uh, what is the, uh, the early age that you can uh, implant and lens, uh, Doctora? What is the earliest age? Uh, it depends on the bilater bilaterality of the cataract. If the cataract is bilateral, I, I prefer to implant at the age of two years. If the cataract is uh, unilateral, I'm forced to implant earlier. So I implant, the lowest age I implant is six months. Six months. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hayat, Dr. Asam, if you are there, uh, any comment or question to Dr. Nihal before we move to Dr. Hayat now? Hayat, you have Dr. Asam, yes. any questions? Yeah. Well, uh, definitely, once again, as usual, uh, Dr. Nihal is one of my favorite presenter when it comes to, it's always uh, a pleasure to hear how systematically she has in her practice and she has thousands of cases, unlike any of us. And um, I really appreciate this. This was a very good presentation. Dr. Asan, any comments? Um, I, that was an excellent presentation. I would ask, uh, instead of doing a posterior rexus, do you ever use the vitrector? Uh, pardon? Instead uh, of doing a um, posterior capsular rexus with the needle that you showed very well, uh, do you ever use the uh, vitrector to do that? Uh, rarely, uh, because rarely. Uh, of course, uh, the gold standard is your hand using rexus forceps, it is much more controllable. But sometimes you are forced to go with a cutter, of course, but I'm just presenting, this is a very straightforward cases for uh, cases to operate, but sometimes cases are complicated when you have flakes, when you have fibrosis, when you have a defect, when you have a posterior lenticanus, definitely sometimes you use a cutter for these cases, but not as a routine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, would like, I would like to add here a comment, uh, Dr. Amri. Thank you so uh, much, Dr. Nihal. Thank you so much for your presentation, first of all. Uh, just uh, uh, Dr. Asim raised the issue of like uh, this very important, sometimes we use the vitreous cutter for the anterior capsular rexes and uh, posterior capsular of both, um, especially in the younger age group, especially once we see that the and the capsule is extremely elastic in those cases. I think it is very handy and a useful instrument. And uh, by the end of it, I have seen beautiful rexes coming. Nothing uh, worse than what we, if we compare to what we do with a capsule rexes for Um Any comments, any more comments or questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, would you like to come in, Dr. Ali? Uh, no, no, no further comments. I think the technique that was shown is very was was excellent, um, and I just we just brought that up because there are cases, as Dr. Nahal mentioned, where uh, the retractor has some advantages. So, 
I think it's a, I think it's a case by case, and and uh, in this case, in these more straightforward cases, definitely you can do an excellent and elegant surgery as, as was demonstrated. Uh, actually, I have uh, here two questions from uh, participants from Dr. Hani Masoud. Why we, we are doing uh, polishing of posterior capsule? However, you are going uh, posterior capsulotomy and uh, anterior vitrectomy. Well, the polishing is the polishing of the back surface of the anterior capsule. Uh, and not the posterior capsule, because lens epithelial cells lies in the equator and on the back surface of the anterior capsule. Concerning the posterior capsule, I'm gonna go for a posterior axis, an anterior vitrectomy. And uh, actually the polishing for the anterior capsule and not the posterior capsule. Uh, but also you mentioned, Dr. Nihal, you are also uh, uh, polishing the posterior capsule, but if, if the center, it is you have to, uh, even if not in the center, I mean, away from the rixes that you are going to perform, right? Yeah. But there is no lens epithelial cells over the posterior. Yes, yes that's right, right. Okay, another another question, please. Uh, uh, is many times difficult to perform anterior rixes in a pediatric patient? We need some advices. It is difficult. It is yeah. not difficult if you. Yeah, this is. You know, because it's maybe you are an expert person, Dr. So uh, not all, everyone is there doing or can have the capability to do. So if there is any, I mean, the special uh, uh, tips to manage or to do this one. I think you have mentioned several of them while you are talking, but if you are summarizing in one or two, three points. Uh, important thing you should have low vitreous pressure. This is number one. You don't want to have high vitreous pressure, but it's going to push the lens uh, forward, uh, more stretching of the anterior capsule. So good anesthesia is number one with good muscle relaxant. You, you, you should perform everything in a tight chamber, in a small chamber. So use a small wound, a very small uh, rexus forceps. This is, I use only 25 gauge. I don't use the conventional rexus forceps in order to go through a very tiny wound with a, with a full anterior chamber, no fluctuation, it will not ever uh, tear from you. This is number two. Uh, I don't use heavy uh, viscoelastics, the usual viscoelastic, uh, the sodium hyaluronate. You start central, don't start the rexus peripheral like adults and don't use the cystitome and push the anterior rexus. This is an extremely elastic anterior capsule. You make a small paracentral tear and then you hold it with the rexus forceps and try to make it in a spiral fashion. Don't go directly towards five millimeter rexus. No, do it in a spiral fashion. Frequent regrasping, sometimes shearing and sometimes tearing, tangential and then towards the center. Extremely elastic. Sometimes when you use Trepan blue stain, it changes the elasticity and makes it less elastic, the anterior capsule. So you may use trepan blue stain, even if you see red reflex, but I only use it in total cataract. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctora. Mm -hmm. If there's any uh, question or comment before we move to the second uh, uh, presenters. Uh, so the second uh, uh, speakers is my dear friend, Dr. Hayat Khan. He will have a presentation about pediatric cataract miscarrying uh, 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 as retinoplastoma. Dr. Hat is well known uh, pediatric ophthalmologist consultant in uh, Dubai hospitals. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amri, for uh, inviting us and uh, being a part of this meeting, uh, this webinar. Uh, with our esteemed colleagues, uh, I'm humbled to be present here and sharing the podium with uh, Dr. Nihal, Dr. Babli, and Dr. Asim Ali, uh, and all other uh, esteemed uh, colleagues. So I have, uh, are, is everybody able to hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Please. All right. And you can see my slides? Yes, please. Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, I actually would like to actually straight away go to this interesting case, which actually came to me um, at the child, uh, a young baby girl, four weeks old,
which was referred to me with uh, leukocoria with abnormal eye movements. Uh, there was no significant history except for that the mother had obstructed labor and the patient had to go through um, cesarean section. Uh, I do remember that the, uh, the, the parents had brought their brother and I had operated him also for a unilateral cataract, which was at the age of five years. And looking at the child, we directly booked the case for an examination under anesthesia with a right lensectomy, um, pretty straightforward thinking. And this is what we saw. This is the anterior segment findings. If you see both the eyes, right as well as the left, if you notice there, uh, both eyes have significant cataracts. Um, and both eyes uh, definitely, it's extremely difficult to see the posterior segment, but we were able to get uh, on doing the B-scan, if you notice, that was something quite unusual. Almost the size of the lens, we could see uh, opacities which were there, dense opacities which were right, carrying the way right up to the back of the eye. And that actually made us really rethink what we're looking and we waited for further dilatation. And once we dilated further, we were able to see a part of uh, the posterior segment. So apparently the pressures were a little low side, nothing significant in the anterior segment except for the central large cataracts, which was symmetrical in both eyes. On fundus examination, we could just have a look, a peek and have a look at the optic discs, which would look normal, the neuro uh, retinal rim was normal and there was no pallor, retina looked flat at the posterior pole. Uh, vessels looked quite fine. We didn't see any angry vessels, no toxicity. Uh, macula, we could not see the macula. Uh, and we could see temporally in the retina, there was a mass, which was uh, a whitish, fluffy, chalky mass, which was evident, which was about four to five this diameter, quite significant. And we were looking at this, I have in my career, I've never had something like a cataract, which is sitting right at the posterior pole. And we were, I was just wondering, uh, am I looking at a retinoblastoma, but I couldn't see any feeder vessels. Um, I was able to see uh, something which was, which I had seen in cases of retinoblastoma, where we had vitreous seeds, something similar, uh, whitish seeds, which were evident all throughout the clocket canal. And I was not really sure what we are dealing and uh, we had already taken the consent. We're planning to take the patient for surgery. So we need to rule out if there is any fungal infection, leukemia, torch infections. Um, and of course we went in and we said, well, let us immediately um, abandon the surgery, take the baby for an MRI before we actually proceed uh, with the case. And uh, we came up with a theory that there may have been a spontaneous rupture or a posterior lenticonus, which has ruptured in the early intrauterine age. And we had to establish a diagnosis. MRI was done and we were quite surprised that on an MRI we further got, if you see that there was an oval mass, which was uh, seen next to the quadri uh, germinal cistern measuring about eight to eight millimeter. Now we were again thinking, are we looking at a pleneoblastoma? Uh, is it a trilateral retinoblastoma? It was a tough call at that point of time. And looking at the usual location, we had consulted with our uh, uh, radiology uh, consultants and we found out that actually it doesn't, isn't actually a um, pineoblastoma. Uh, Instead is actually a case of um, lipoma, which is quite unusual, but was, was significant was a lot of findings were quite significantly making us rethink what to do. But anyhow, at that point of time, we found another important finding, which is here in this particular slide that if you notice both the right and the left eye, lenses are quite different than usually. If I go back to the initial slide that I show for the huge amount of cataracts that you see, the amount of lenses that you see here 
in right and left eye is practically absent as compared to a usual T2 image that you see here. This is on another patient with the normal lenses with the same age group as a reference I put in here. And we compared with uh, a T2 image if you see here. So you would see some along the pocket canal, there were some opacities that you see, but amazingly you couldn't see any cataract. So where exactly is the lens? That was the question. So the answer to it was of course, uh, we thought now this we are dealing with a bilateral congenital cataract with the uh, cortex along the clocket canal, which was actually uh, masquerading as a retinoblastoma. And we went in with the surgery and we took the consent. We explained the family in detail at every stage and a symmetrical surgery. And if you notice here, you see that hanging mass right at the back. Uh, if you want, I can just go back a little and again show there is a hanging mass that you see. Uh, if you notice just behind the, uh, the lens, it is actually a retro equatorial area that you see there. And of course, we had taken a pospin approach, understanding that we were, um, when I had done an indirect ophthalmoscopy, I actually saw uh, this mass sitting right next to the macula. So we did an examination, as you see, we are doing examination, as you see here, uh, we could see, uh, we were very fortunate, we put our vitro retinal uh, surgeon on standby and they were for great help. And we looked at the back and then once we established that, of course, um, the, the exact nature of cataract that we were dealing with, we went in and we started removing the cataract, starting removing the remnant cortex and the posterior capsule. And once we had removed that, then of course we went straight behind and then we took out the cataract, uh, both eyes, more or less similar procedure. Um, I, I, I feel that the posterior approach was far um, more comfortable as compared to the anterior approach for this particular case. A uh, lot of times that uh, especially our uh, colleagues who are not trained for the vitro retina, they will feel a little uncomfortable. Of course, this can be taken in, in, through the anterior approach, but the remnants that you see and the amount of cataract that you see through the crocket canal is huge. As a matter of fact, we found that the total amount was even bigger than the lens uh, in a usual way. So I, I, I assume that the cortical cells, they proliferated and they eventually made this mass look so big. So once we had completed um, through this approach, I will just forward it a little. You see there, there it is, this is all. So some of these may look like um, seeding, which may be also a finding in a case of retinoblastoma. But if you see in this particular case, this is all cortex and um, I would say anterior cortical cells proliferation and these cells have gone. So my assumption is that this child had a posterior capsular uh, rupture at a very early age, antenatal age. And uh, looking at the amount of cataract which was absorbed, I assume that over the time, um, a, a lot of in the, the cortex was absorbed and the rest had spilled over right at the back. And as you see here, it's sitting right onto the uh, fovea. And if you notice, uh, we had, uh, I was very happy Dr. Lamba was there and he came in and he proceeded with this step because I was not very comfortable. So I would strongly suggest that it is very good to have uh, a vitreo retina support. And especially I presented this case for this meeting in which we are looking at. Um, uh, and of course, in the end, we ensured that we have not left anything behind. This is uh, seven days post-op, if you see the child. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there is something to be noticed. The glasses, they, the father got wrong number. Of course, we asked them to change. This is uh, not the classes which we had prescribed. And uh, of course, it was a plus 12 number that the baby had. And baby was seen quite well. This is what the posterior segment looked like. Um, this is an optus image. If you see both eyes, um, quite remarkable. Uh, there are some artifacts that otherwise everything looked fine. 
So I just conclude this, what we have is a pre-existing posterior capsular defect. And these are, this is always a possibility when any membrane, and of course, posterior capsule is no exclusion, can actually, once it gets ruptured at any uh, time during the embryonic development, it can cause, it is seen almost about 10% uh, cases as reported by Dr. Singh. Uh, he has a lot of work in India on this particular subject from where I have taken this data. And of course, it can be unilateral or bilateral. Here, if you see this particular uh, case, there is, of course, uh, a pre-existing posterior capsular defect. And what happens is that once this posterior capsule is breached, the crystalline lens development is exposed to a lot of fluid. And this can actually give rise to a very different form, uh, different event formation and different chain of events start in which the local hydration, opacification, leukefaction, absorption, posterior migration of the lens material toward the Berger space. And in this particular case, it went right up to the uh, posterior pole. Several other cases have been reported as you see here, sometimes you may even see, uh, we just about a week back operated a case in which there was, uh, because of the time constraint, I'm not taking that case, but of course we had a, a different case where sometimes blood vessels are present in the Burger space that you see here. And we need to make sure that we take off these vessels and preferably use the fugo blade or uh, endodiathermy to proceed with these cases. And of course, few tips in the end, uh, anterior and posterior, both approaches are there, but we have to ensure a good understanding of disease before we take the step. Of course, anterior approach is uh, much more uh, known by, by our colleagues. Um, there are less chances of inflammation, glaucoma and RD, but posterior approach has its own advantages, especially in cases like what I had just shown you. And of course, there are a few other tips, of course. Um, if the dilatation is not very well, we can use intracaramel, uh, cameral uh, preservative rate 0.25% uh, phenylephrine. Then, of course, uh, not only the uh, coaxial illumination, but an oblique illumination while doing the surgery is helpful to understand the configuration of how the pathology is. And, of course, um, a few good blade can always be used um, and membranous cataract of course it's always a good idea that we inflate the back with viscoelastics material these are few of my uh, recommendations and of course thank you so much everybody um, i would like to conclude the presentation here uh, thank you dr hayat it's a very interesting case uh, if there is any question for Dr. Hayat from any uh, panelists here, Dr. Yes. Ihab, Dr. Ihab or Dr. Hassan. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Hayat. Very interesting case, yeah, as usual from you. If you are expecting that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hayat. So, okay, any question for Dr. Hayat? How frequent we can see this, this uh, uh, kind of cases, Dr. Hayat? Well, as I said, this one, particularly this one, I have seen, and of course, I have such uh, esteemed colleagues, their experience, have they had a, a case like this? Uh, I know Dr. Nihal's numbers, I know her numbers, I know Dr. Ali, uh, and of course, Babli, I would like to throw this because this particular presentation that I showed you, it was, I, I had a, like, of course, my I got numb the moment I saw the posterior pole and I saw the, the seeds, I said, well, I cannot proceed, I have to postpone your surgery, and I would like to throw this back to our colleagues. I mean, I have seen this for the first time. Yeah, okay, Dr. Anihal, just uh, uh, mute, you are mute, Dr. Anihal. If you can unmute yourself, please, first. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be really with you, Dr. Hayat, to speak with you. Uh, I, I did participate with you last uh, year in, uh, in the course in pediatric cataract surgery. Well, concerning the posterior uh, capsule defect, the congenital one, it is actually very common. Uh, we see it frequently. It is sometimes misdiagnosed. 
uh, you know, uh, what uh, the eye will not see, what the brain doesn't know. Sometimes uh, we perform the cataract surgery and we say, oops, posterior capsule did uh, open and uh, the remnants of uh, lens matter uh, went behind. But actually it is there from the start. And it is very common. And that's why uh, in the presentation I said, take care before performing hydrodissection, we have to look uh, perfectly and uh, extensively to the morphology of the congenital cataract. Maybe it is associated by its own like that. Maybe it is associated with posterior capsular plague. And sometimes it is associated even with a posterior lenticons. So uh, I see it frequently in, uh, in, in uh, congenital cataract uh, surgery. Uh, do, do you think, uh, Dr. Nihar, Dr. Arif, or any one of the, my colleagues here, we have to do OC, I mean, sorry, ultrasound for all patients? So by this, it's, we can uh, avoid, uh, I mean, this, uh, any findings that we only see it uh, after we go uh, ahead in the surgery? Of course. Yeah, it is a mandatory that we can say it is a mandatory to do ultrasound. So then you can find that there is something inside the retina and then that we can think about it. Is it? Uh, I, I would uh, I would say yes, as Dr. Nihal said, I think it is mandatory to perform a good examination under an NSC shaft with which, of course, um, uh, doing an ultrasound is a part of it as a not only routine, it is, I would say, a mandatory, especially in a case like this, because the question here is, would you like to take an anterior approach or a posterior approach? Uh, I really do not know how many of us would be comfortable to go in so deep and I want to know, Dr. Nihal, uh, does she take a posterior approach in these cases? Uh, what is the way? Well, Dr. Hayat, I prefer the anterior approach. It is very simple and very easy. I'm not aggressive with the vitreous. Uh, I would not resort to uh, perslana vitrectomy because majority of these cases, the lens matter is not that far from the posterior capsule. You can get it easily and you can clear the central part of the vitreous through the anterior approach. And rarely, as in your case, it was located very posterior near the macular area. So in your case, I think, no, it was advisable to go through the posterior approach. But in many other cases, the lens matter is located just behind the posterior capsule that can be cleared easily through the anterior approach. I, I go for the anterior approach. Yeah. I, okay. I, Thank so, you very much. Uh, there is any comment, sorry? Dr. Uh, I was just- Dr. Uh, Hassan, yes. My experience, uh, the, the posterior capsule opening is very common as was mentioned, and most of the time, the lens material, if it proliferates, it stays in burger space. So yeah. it's very, very anterior. It's, and usually the, you go through the pre-existing defect and you can easily access the material. It just sucks up right away. So what's unusual in this case is that it kind of migrated down Cloquet's canal or there's some congenital abnormality there. Uh, so that's, that's what's unusual. I would say, uh, you know, it's very rare that anything like this would occur. Oh, the vast majority of time, it just, as long as you know it's there, it's it's very easy to uh, take care of it. And uh, and just about the ultrasound comment, I think it's extremely important to have access because retinoblastoma can um, can present like this very rarely. And the other reason is also, uh, which hasn't been mentioned, is uh, PHPV or PFV uh, yes. for unilateral cataracts. It's helpful to know that going into the eye that you have something like that there, so that you can have cautery. Or if there's a retinal detachment, you have somebody there who can help you fix that, um, uh, rather than finding that on on the table. Uh, thank you very much. Any comment, Dr. Ihab, or any others before we proceed to our last presenter, to our guest speaker, Dr. Azam? Thank you, Dr. Hayat. Yeah. Okay. So um, our uh, Last uh, presenter today is uh, uh, Dr. Asan. He will give a challenging uh, pediatric cataract with corneal uh, comorbidities. And Dr. Asan Ali is an ophthalmologist in chief of the Hospital for Sick Children's Department of Ophthalmology and Vision uh, Science and holds the rank of associate professor at the University of Toronto. There is a lot of things to mention about Dr. Asan Ali, but he is well known for everybody. So without any further ado, please, Dr. Asan, go ahead. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. 
and um, right. so can everyone see that? Yes, it's very clear. Okay. That also, yeah. So, um, I, um, so thank you for the invitation to speak. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, I uh, have an interest in um, pediatric anterior segment, and I do corneal transplant. And um, and I uh, was going to focus today on um, cataract surgery um, in conditions with uh, corneal abnormalities, but I'm mostly going to focus on uh, post transplant and also situations where the cornea is cloudy. Um, and I'm going to speak for um, about. I'm going to try to aim for my talk for about uh, ten minutes or so. I'm going to do mostly a video based talk, and uh, just to start with, this is. Um, this is a sort of a typical case um, uh, that um, we'll deal with. This is a child who has a 10 millimeter cornea, has had a transplant, corneal transplant for a Peter's anomaly, and um, now has developed a cataract. Um, this is now the child's about 12 years old. Um, and just a few points as we move along. Um, often in these cases, with the, there's a clear transplant in this case, so I'm not gonna focus so much on visualization but often there's iris abnormalities here and there's adhesions between the graftose interface and the, um, and the iris, as well as multiple synechiae and previous iridectomies. And there's a membrane over the anterior surface of the lens. Um, with these kinds of eyes, it's really important to use as small incisions as possible. And all of these maneuvers are being done under a, a dispersive viscoelastic. The other point here is that the um, anterior capsule in these kinds of cases can be very fibrotic um, and, uh, and I can't start the rexus here. Now, normally, um, as was discussed earlier, um, you don't want to start the rexus peripherally, but in this particular case, I'm working outside of, the, um, um, outside of this fibrous plaque. So this is, I will normally start sort of centrally from my rexus, but here we're trying to use the scissors and then um, use a partial scissors and partial uh, capsular rexus forceps. The other thing is uh, you can also approach your rexus from multiple directions. So in this case, I'm using another port to make it easier uh, in order to complete the rexus because of the lack of view uh, at the graftose interface. And uh, the other thing you'll notice is that the rexus here is very small and that's for because of my limitations in uh, visualization. Um, I'll often want to remove the lens uh, through a smaller rexus so I can get my lens in place and I can enlarge it later on, um, especially because the um, iris will not dilate any further. And, um, and then I use, uh, as was discussed earlier, I'll use a cutter. Um, and uh, when I'm moving um, my infusion, um, I like to use a anterior uh, chamber maintainer and use viscoelastic to prevent the capsule, to prevent the anterior segment from collapsing or the chamber from collapsing. Um, and that's helpful to produce, reduce the risk of um, iris prolapse. And uh, you have to be, watch your angles and how long your incisions are um, because of the graftose interface. And in these cases, I prefer one piece in the bag, um, and especially with the smaller cornea is here, um, it expands quite nicely and there's not a lot of tension. And in many of these cases, I will enlarge the rexus as, as necessary. Okay. So this is, um, and, um, but the more common situation with, uh, with corneal opacities uh, and corneal abnormalities is that of an opacity. And we see many causes of corneal opacity. There can be uh, due to corneal edema, it could be due to a rejection of a corneal transplant, or congenital corneal opacities. Um, and sometimes it's advantageous to remove the cataract before you do further corneal procedures. It's entirely possible in children to do, uh, for example, trifle procedures, um, such as a, you know, a penetrating keratoplasty uh, with, uh, with open sky removal of the cataract. Um, but that has its risks. There's often a lot of posterior vitreous pressure in these children. Um, and, um, and you can compromise the corneal transplant later on um, by doing too many procedures at the same time. So uh, now with more experience, I try, not to, I try to avoid combined procedures, even though they can be very interesting. 
um, and actually try to remove the cataract beforehand. That way you reduce the amount of inflammation. You also end up with a, for example, an IOL in good position um, and very stable when you have to do your transplant. There's also situations where keratoplasty is not really indicated. There are some children, for example, with extensive surface disease, such as an aniridia, or for example, who've had multiple transplants and um, you're not able to maintain a clear cornea, but the lens is actually the biggest cause of vision loss. And in those situations, you need to be able to remove the cataract in a cloudy cornea, um, and uh, you may not want to do a corneal transplant later on. Um, some of this was uh, shown earlier, but one of the best strategies for dealing with a cloudy cornea in children and in adults is to change the direction of illumination. So your uh, microscope uses a direct and diffuse light, um, and there's a lot of reflection off the cornea when, that, when there is any kind of corneal opacity. So your two options are to use retroillumination using the microscope. And in most modern microscopes, it's actually very difficult to do that. Um, you, can, you can just dial down the direct illumination and use retroillumination, but because it's central, it tends to cause a lot of um, light scatter. In some of the older microscopes, you can actually rotate the light in, and sometimes that's very helpful um, in, in terms of uh, reducing the amount of backscatter. My preferred technique now is to use the light pipe, um, and um, Hayat talked a little bit about that. Dr. Hayat talked a little bit about that earlier. The other technique is to use con increase your contrast. Um, you can use both tripan, view, uh, tripan blue as well as triamcinolone to do this. So this is a case of a failed uh, corneal transplant. Um, and uh, the cataract is, again, the bigger cause of visual um, uh, abnormality. And I wanted to stage procedures here and remove the cataract first. Again, um, it's possible to do a triple, but you can actually do the cataract surgery um, by removing the epithelium and using a, a, a viscoelastic or dispersive viscoelastic material to smooth out the irregularities. Um, we're using tripan blue to sew the capsule. And here what I'm doing is uh, doing a vitrector rexus because there's really no view to do a proper capsule rexus. Uh, my assistant here is uh, my trainee is helping with external uh, light pipe. You can also go inside the eye as well. Um, there's different ways to do it. And removing and going through multiple ports and removing all the lens material here. And the plan here is to place the lens um, within the bag and then do the um, anterior vitrectomy from the front. Again, the visualization, it looks quite good, but it's actually fairly poor. Um, and you can see the rexus, the anterior rexus is not perfect. The strategy here then is to um, place the lens in the bag. And in this case, I'm using a, a three-piece IOL. It gives me more options if I need to place it in the sulcus and capture the lens. But ideally, I'm able to put this now within the bag. And the light pipe allows me to figure out the planes uh, to make sure that I'm placing the lens actually within the bag, then the haptics are all within the bag. And I can always fix the capsule rexus later on. What I'm doing here is with the uh, light pipe inside the bag and reducing the amount of direct illumination, I'm actually able to get underneath the lens and then do the remove the posterior capsular plaque that you saw and do the anterior vitrectomy. This is not as effective as doing it under good visualization. And the, tri the triamcinolone here just makes sure that I, after doing all of this, I don't have any vitreous in the AC. And then you can see a much better view. Then the cornea is going to be a little bit cloudy, but now with a good um, IOL in the bag, I can go later on and do either DSEC or PK. Um, this size had multiple previous surgeries. Um, and in fact, uh, we didn't actually do any further surgery and this child was seeing much, much better. The family opted not to do any further um, surgery. Um, this is a boy with uh, another case. This is a boy with uh, Down syndrome um, and autism um, who used to uh, punch himself. So this is why I'm doing a scleral tunnel because of the risk of rupture. The graft that you see there is very large. Uh, and that's intentional because he had keratoconus, and that's a, uh, a DALC, an anterior lamellar graft. Um, he's also had rejection, and you'll see during the case that his opacities are quite large. 
um, because of his behavior and because of how difficult it is uh, to manage him post-op, we were not going to change the graft and his vision decreased because of the white cataract. You can see here that there is some opacity in the transplant, but he's generally, um, generally it's fairly clear. Um, and I'm just going to remove some uh, lens material because it's a white cataract and using the vision blue to aid with uh, visualization here. Um, now what will happen here, uh, and the reason I'm showing this, is that I'll reach a point where I'm no longer able to see my, um, my uh, capsorexis flap uh, because of there's a corneal opacity right on top. And there's, of course, a lot of lens material. And um, it's hard to videotape this clearly, but when you do this, you can actually see at a certain level very well. And we can complete the, the capsorexis here. And once that's done, it's, of course, very easy to remove a, um, a lens like this. And, um, and then we can then place the lens within the bag. Um, a good capsular support in, the ch in a, a, a patient like this is very, very critical um, because of their tendency to rub their eyes and, uh, and also cause trauma. And you can see that with the light pipe, a lot of the opacity, it really looks much better than it actually is. And you're able to remove all of the lens material um, and, and um, a lot of the cortex very, very cleanly and go underneath the anterior capsule to sort of clean it um, and polish it as much as possible and also remove the cortex. And it's important to be able to move your light pipe around uh, if necessary, making an extra port to go inside the eye. Um, and you can see again here that the uh, anterior rexus I've made is very small and that had to be corrected later on. So I'll sort of move uh, uh, I'll, uh, Move ahead here, you can actually insert um, uh, a lens through a very small rexus. And I prefer um, in these cases because having a lens that's not sitting well in this child is a real problem. Um, I, I prefer to actually place it through a smaller rexus and then enlarge it later on, um, either manually with the scissors and the rexus forcep or with the cutter. And so that's lens is now is a three piece lens in the bag. And I will skip ahead here for the sake of time and uh, then just go ahead and enlarge your capsorexis to almost uh, five and a half, five to five and a half millimeters. You can see the red reflex is much improved. And in fact, um, his vision improved significantly until he was about 20 over 40, uh, which for him was very functional because he would not wear any glasses. Um, I want to show one last case before we finish. Uh, and this is using the ocular endoscope. Um, and this is a young girl who had a penetrating corneal injury. You can see on the left-hand side, the laceration that was there. And after, uh, and uh, this penetrated the lens and affected the iris. And you can see on the right, after cataract surgery, um, uh, that the visual axis is clear, but there was a, a lens tilt. And what I was not able to see at the time of surgery is that, that there was a bit of vitreous and capsule that was attached to the cornea. And this is using a gonioscopic view on the right at the time of at, uh, later on. And this was indu inducing um, a significant astigmatism and lens tilt. So it was decided to go ahead and remove this. And uh, this is using the ocular endoscope. And I apologize for the dots. Those are little uh, uh, um, irregularities on the light pipe. This is a 20, this is a 19 gauge ocular endoscope. And uh, now we use the 23 gauge endoscope. And you can see here inside the eye, underneath the corneal opacity in the scar, this is using 23 gauge scissors. So it's under high magnification. And all we need to do is to be able to sever this. So instead of doing a blind sweep or cutting, we can then use sharp dissection. You can see the lens moves posteriorly. And this corrected, uh, it was about almost three diopters of uh, uh, oblique cylinder was corrected by doing this. And the lens uh, maintained in a, an excellent position after this. So uh, just in summary then, when you're dealing with uh, corneal opacities in children, you have a variety of diff different techniques you can use. Um, and changing your angle of illumination is very important. Uh, you can use the ocular endoscope and then use a uh, tripan blue um, and try and send alone to aid with your visualization. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Dr. Asim. Very interesting, and of course, this one we are, you know, I was thinking how you are going to see, but you know, it's an experience for me. I cannot see anything when you are doing the surgery. I don't know if there is any comment or uh, any question from uh, your colleagues here, Dr. Ihab, Dr. Anihal, or Dr. Hayat. Thank you very much. Anything about yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Asim. You have very interesting cases, yeah, and very, very difficult cases as well. Yeah? And I think in each case, you have to choose a new strategy because this is not a, a, sim, a single one, according yeah, to what I was saying. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I think you have to have a few different tools in these cases um, because mm -hmm. each one has its own challenges, and you also have to think carefully about what your goals are. Um, for that particular child and, and what your expectations are for their vision. Uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Asim. Once again, um, amazing cases. Of course, um, I have been trained by Dr. Ali, so of course he's my mentor also. So I just have a very specific question, Dr. Ali, about um, I just recently had actually about a, a week or two weeks an opportunity to operate a case which is having a Peter's anomaly and with Peters, we had uh, uh, a minimal uh, coloboma bilateral. Peters is in one eye, and that's the bad eye. And the parents were very anxious, and they wanted to have the earliest. Of course, there was an associated cataract also. So I went in, and I, when when I went in, I saw a whole bunch of vessels. Now, initially, I was thinking that this may be a persistent vital vasculature, but what I realized, the vessels were coming from the corner mm -hmm. on the on the uh, a whole web. The question is, we do not have here in Dubai uh, the privilege to have both the teams working together where we can do in the same uh, sitting. So I had to, uh, opted for an optical iridectomy, a minimal optical iridectomy also, so that through the side, I have sent you the pictures through WhatsApp on your mobile, but uh, the patient needs a second stage surgery. Maybe preferably we would like to have somebody who can actually deal these cases on a routine basis. Um, what would be the best approach? Should we have had a uh, uh, a system in which this can be done in the same sitting, or do you think we have some time? It's a unilateral case. The other eye is better. Uh, so, um, so you can do a whole lecture on the management of Peter's anomaly, but just uh, briefly speaking, um, you your options are if you have some clear cornea, you can do an optical iridectomy and maybe even remove the lens, and you can have a very good outcome just with that without doing uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Um, if you have a very large central opacity, four or five millimeters, it becomes very difficult to do that and you have to move on to penetrating keratoplasty. But, but removal of the lens, if, the, if there's a cataract or with um, uh, optical iridectomy is very reasonable. And, um, and especially for unilateral cases when the other eye is, is normal or just has a coloboma and can otherwise see well, um, then it's really hard to justify um, a lot of surgery in those cases uh, because the visual results are not necessarily any better. So we've looked at this um, uh, in, our, in, our, in our data for penetrating keratoplasty. Some of the best patients actually, uh, instead of doing keratoplasty, if you do optical iridectomy, you can see very well. So um, you can see 20, 30, 20, 40 with an optical iridectomy that's well-placed and, and if you deal with the, with the lens opacity. So it's a very complex question. I mean, you have to look at each patient individually, but uh, the answer isn't just doing uh, keratoplasty on everyone. And in fact, sometimes if you do keratoplasty, you have more complications, more rejection, um, and a higher rate of glaucoma as well. So, um, so it's, it's hard to answer your question, but that's sort of a general, uh, the sort of general advice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asam. Uh, any other question to Dr. Asam? Dr. Nihal, Dr. Ihab. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think we came now to the end of our session. I would like to thank you all, dear colleagues, uh, starting with Dr. Nihal for, and Dr. Asam, they are our guest speaker today, and my dear colleagues, Dr. Ihab and Dr. Hayat. I'd like also to thank the, uh, my dear uh, friends also and colleagues for the previous session, Dr. Noura Mansouri Mandib Lamba and Farid Sadiqi. 
and very special thanks also for uh, Bayern for their support and sponsoring this meeting. And also, I would like to thank the management event. And very, very special thanks for all participants. They are sitting with us till this time and following us. And we hope to see you, inshallah, in fourth of or in second week of uh, September. And we are. I want to announce now that we are going to have uh, a conference, a virtual conference on 17 and 18 of uh, 17, 18 and 19 of September. And from this uh, place, I'd like to invite Dr. Asim to accept our invitation to participate with us. Dr. Anihan, it will be our pleasure and honor to be with us, Dr. Asim and Dr. Anihan. Already I have prepared some of the topics with Dr. Hayat Khan and other colleagues with Dr. Ihab al -Bandi. We'll select them and we'll update you if you accept our invitation. Uh, thanks for, your for all. And I think there is only one question. Oh, no, they are thinking. Okay. Thank you very much and good night. See you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. There's Thank two you. questions, Dr. Mohammed. You don't have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ihab. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks have so a good much. night Thanks and so have a great day, Dr. Ali. Nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night.